Okay. Hey guys, this is Sean DeGray. Nobody knows who that is, but <laughs> it's me. <laughs> and you are listening to The Gritty Bowman. <laughs> it's all in perspective, right? If you could make $150,000 a year, but you had to work 80 hours a week and you were committed to a corporation that you hated what you did, is that more lucrative than making $70,000 a year doing what you love with a lot of free time? And who's richer? One of the things I never want to say, and I even think this with life, is I never want to say, like, what if? Mm. Like, what? I hate that. I hate that feeling. What if I would have done this? Or what if I would have just tried this? Or what if? What if? And there's very few things that I say what if about. Very few things. And that gives me a lot of peace of mind. Um, so that helps give me drive because I don't want to ever say what, what if. if. Randy always says this. You'll, you're going to run out of health before you run out of money. Part, like for me it's just like part of being a dude mm-hmm. you know it's just like you just you just you don't quit right mm-hmm. like you don't stop because <laughs> there's one thing that's like a little bit tough it's like man welcome to life you know for hunters it's generally over like the long haul right more mm-hmm. of like uh you know making sure that we have good base level strength so that our joints are strong and the muscles around our joints are strong so they can start to handle kind of like these longer rucks or hikes and, yeah. and varied terrain and things like that. So let's say a guy does have a bad shoulder, you know, what are, how does he get that back? How does he fix yeah. it? First. So if I'm a guy that just wants to be, it's just a beast in the woods. Yeah. I mean, I want to be able to climb the mountain. I want to go to 14,000 feet. I want to come back down on the cover, cover 10 miles a day. I, I feel like if I'm that guy, what I want to do is just hike a lot yeah. with a heavy backpack. Right. Because that's what you want to be good at, That's right? what I want to be good at. So yeah. I want to do that activity all the time. So I need to be convinced that there is yeah. a value in doing anything besides that. For sure. Um, because for me, it's like, dude, if I throw a pack on and I hike all the time, am I not going to be really good at that yeah all right folks welcome to the gritty bowen podcast we're at crossfit park city i'm here with chris spieler uh and you've been on the podcast before you and your wife sarah and we talked fitness we we kind of introduced you to the audience a little bit and you are a seven time crossfit games competitor yeah and in a past life (laughs) (laughs) right (laughs) and uh you own uh this gym here yeah and you also own the icon athlete podcast and you are um you've you've you own the brand icon athlete yeah and um and i've been involved in that getting to know the programming and doing some at home uh work for fitness but um and we'll get into that over time but basically what I want people listening to know is uh, that if they don't know you, to go and listen to the earlier podcast, so they really can get a feel for you, your family, what you're all sure. about, what you value. You're good at uh, helping people understand proper movement and body movement and why it matters. Yeah, um, I, I've always kind of gone to when I look up uh, a movement, I'm like, um, you know, like how to how to uh, do a proper pull up slash Chris Spieler YouTube. <laughs> yeah. And I, I try to find something you did, <laughs> right? Crossed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then I follow that and make sure I have good movement. But a lot of people I find don't really know much about movement or why it matters or even think, think about it. I have guys tell me my knees hurt, my back hurts, yeah. my, my shoulder is, is messed up. They come and they tell me that or they're, they're telling me that they're, eating, they're taking ibuprofen on their hunts for seven days straight for four. 800 milligrams every four right. hours, right? Just to keep the pain at bay. Yeah, and it's thing. just a way of life now. Yeah. It's just part of being athletic, being 40 and older, that kind of thing, right? Yeah. And what I found is that's not true, but I have a hard time convincing people that they can address their prop, their knee and their shoulder and their hip and be and feel young again. Yeah. No, it's a good question. I think one of the first things is like context. So I'm a big fan of that, kind of looking back at the context of things. Okay, like if I do have back pain or do have knee pain or do have shoulder pain, is there a pre-existing injury? You know, is there something that I did previously? Football. Yeah. And those things can all play a role, right? Mm -hmm. 
And if those things are, uh, you know, the reality, like, you know, whatever, playing football in high school and I blew out my knee and it's always give me, given me issues. Those are things we kind of need to take into consideration. But in my experience, most of the injuries that I see where it's like joint pain and things like that, it's typically like overuse and mixed with like weakness, yeah. you know? Okay. So it's, what do you mean by weakness? Yeah. So I think it's easy for us to fall into this category of, um, either like old school train of thought where like we used to like bench press, you know, do bench and buys cause it's awesome. Right. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> I need big packs. <laughs> right. Cause I mean, I need a date. So <laughs> that's right. Right. When you were 14 years old, like we did bench press and bicep curls. Cause that's, that's right. what all the dudes did. <laughs> um, so I think uh, like understanding how, c- how can we be strong and where do we want to be strong from and how do we, how does that apply toward what we do is a really important piece because you know, for, hunters it's generally over like the long haul right more of like uh you know making sure that we have good base level strength so that our joints are strong and the muscles around our joints are strong so they can start to handle kind of like these longer rocks or hikes and yeah and varied terrain and things like that so there's a piece of us making sure that we train like that but i think that if people train like that too much and they don't have a base level of strength, that's where they start to run into the overuse injury. And the same thing could be said about CrossFit or Mm -hmm. uh, anything. You know, if we don't have a base level of strength and we kind of run into the repetitive movements, we can see that happen. So what do you mean by repetitive injury or repetitive? So what's what's funny, I was talking to a a guy this morning and he was saying that uh, when he was younger, he's like, you know, I didn't start to like the way that I look, so I started to run half marathons and marathons. And he's like, I got hurt a lot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and generally I think repetitive can be anything. It doesn't mean running is bad for us. It doesn't mean us going on a hunt is bad for us. It's just that if we, if that's all we do, Mm -hmm. you know, that's all the only way that we train and it becomes so repetitive, we can just see overuse injuries kind of creep in instead of having a more well-rounded approach that we can apply toward the specific thing that we like to do. I don't remember where I read it, but I read it, some study where they had said they, they, they did these stats where they took kids that played football, yeah, basketball, soccer, you know, whatever. They went through baseball. They went through the season, and they switched from sport to sport to sport. That their injury rate was like, like, like eighty percent less. Yeah, way than a sport specific athlete who played, who let's take football for example, played football, and then after the season still played football, went to football camps, right? Did, or, or whether it's that or track, they just ran, 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 ran. They didn't do multiple sports. Yeah, that they that sport specific athletes who focused on one sport their their generally their whole life struggled with injuries in a way that athletes that did uh, multiple sports don't. For sure. And I agree. I think that's what we see. And I think we can see that in any avenue. I think the cool thing about kind of the methodology that we use at Icon and CrossFit is it's just this varied approach, Mm -hmm. right? And because of that natural variance, you see, at least in my experience, I see less and less injuries by overuse. Like the things that we see in here is like someone dropped a kettlebell and smacked their finger together, you know? Yep, yep bash their face they tripped on a box and hit their shin you know that's like those are the injuries that we see which is just like welcome to life right yeah (laughs) but but, uh but yeah as far as like overuse injuries because of the variance and the variety and that could apply toward sports specific and it could apply toward um you know training methodologies that's i think a really smart way to go about it so if i'm a guy that just wants to be it's just a beast in the woods yeah, I mean, I want to be able to climb the mountain. I want to go to 14,000 feet. I want to come back down. I want to be able to cover, cover 10 miles a day, 15 miles. I want to be able to go in, climb, you know, have endurance, right? Yeah. And I want to come back down. Tell me why I shouldn't. I mean, I I feel like if I'm that guy, what I want to do is just hike a lot yeah. with a heavy backpack. Right. Because that's what you want to be good at, right? That's what I want to be good at. So I want to do that activity all the time. So, and I don't really feel like I have the time necessarily. I mean, what's the value? I need to be convinced that there's a value in doing anything besides that. For sure. Um, Because for me, it's like, dude, if I throw a pack on and I hike all the time, am I not going to be really good at that? Yeah. So first, I think is we're not saying that's bad, right? You still need to go 
hike and carry a pack. That still should be a piece of what you guys do because that's what you do outside, yeah. right? So it doesn't mean we stop that. Now, do I need to do that five or seven days a week? That's kind of where we go back to the context. And in my experience with people that I've seen that really are passionate about putting their fitness to use outside the confines of the gym, uh-huh. um, it could be a hunter, it could be a skier, it could be, I don't care Mount what it is. Yeah, anything. The more we increase our general physical preparedness, or our base level of fitness, the more potential we have to be better at the very specific thing that we're looking to do. And the reason why is it gives us a well-rounded base of fitness that we can work from. And those building blocks, if we don't have building blocks and create this broad base, our pyramid can never be high you know, in that okay. sense, the base, the base is, is the foundation the of that pyramid. If you don't build that strong base, then all that other stuff you stack on it, it's only going to be so high. Yeah. Right. And then if you think of having a really small base and now you're trying to create this high peak, it's not going to be as strong. Right. And that's where I think you start to see some of those overuse injuries. So the variance and what's cool too, is like with the CrossFit methodology, they have this, this full on, like, like we admit, Hey, we do this, this is how we train. And then it kind of goes into this black box and here's the output. So here's the input. It goes in this black box and here's the output. I don't know what happens in that black box. I can't tell you exactly why people get better at their specific things. But what I can tell you is that I've seen it time and time again, Mm -hmm. when people just do their general physical preparedness work, they're better at their sports specific stuff. So what is, what do you mean when you say base level of fitness? Yeah. So like, uh, you can look at a different, a bunch of different ways in CrossFit. If you get real CrossFit, they talk about these 10 general physical skills uh-huh. and they use this as Are those modalities. One, yeah. Or? Like one of the metrics mm-hmm. of how to measure your fitness. And if you rattle them out, like it'll, you know, it's just a lot, but it's cardio respiratory endurance. It's strength, flexibility, speed, power, stamina, coordination, accuracy, agility, and balance. And then the whole idea is that we want to be most balanced across all 10 of those. I don't, jack of all trades. Exactly. And the master of none. And what happens, and we see this happen all the time, and it doesn't mean that people are bad or that they have a character flaw or something like that. But what it means is that if I have a specialist, right, mm-hmm. the most elite endurance athlete in the world, man, they're really good at du- endurance, yeah. but they can't squat their backpack. You right. know what I mean? So it's like they've gone so far to one end that their cardiorespiratory endurance and stamina is so great, but their strength is really low. Yeah. Same side of the, you know, flip the side of the coin there. And now you have someone that can deadlift a thousand pounds, but they can't run a mile. You got to yeah. time it with a sundial. They get tired you know? going to the mailbox. <laughs> exactly. So if we can create this big, broad base, what that means is that you're less likely And those kind of terms that we look at in the CrossFit sense is let's say you're less likely to fail at the margins of your experience. And what that means, if I, if I only experience this one little thing, if I get pulled outside of that, I'm really likely to fail. If I can broaden that experience, well, now I'm less likely to fail. Got it. Cause I think back to when I played basketball a lot Mm -hmm. and, um, and then I started doing CrossFit. So as I was playing basketball, um, my low back would hurt every night afterward. The next day it'd be stiff. It'd even give out a lot. You know, it's just having these problems and I'm in my early thirties. I'm going, what is yeah. wrong? Right. And, normal. uh, I would play basketball four or five days a week, three days a week. I played a lot and I was actually in good shape and played well. Yeah. But yet Chris, I kept having back problems. Yeah. And sometimes my knees would hurt. What was that? Why? I think there's a couple things. One, it could be overuse, right? Because I, I went through that too on the CrossFit side of things. So with that, all that competing over seven years, you know, and me just training in a way that was going to have me try to win the CrossFit games. That's a yep. very different thing than training for life. Um, you know, just crazy joint pain. I had a hard time walking up and down steps. Mm-hmm. Um, so recovery is really important. You guys work hard, whether at it, it for some of the listeners that might be like, they work hard all day at their job, yeah, you know, and then they do things to train for a hunt, you know, so they work hard, so they need to recover. And there's some really simple metrics that you can look at as far as to see how you're recovering. Mm -hmm. Um, So those are the topics we can get into later on. Um, But the other thing is just having a a base level of strength. And I'm not talking about being able to deadlift 600 pounds, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. 
But what I see a lot of athletes do is they get kind of stuck in that endurance, longer duration type thing, and they work on the cardiovascular side, and they just lose strength through their midline. They lose strength in their legs. And then that puts your joints, it could put your joints at risk because the musculature around it isn't strong and supporting it. And what I think most people forget is that your back has some of the biggest muscles in your body in it. Mm -hmm. And if those aren't strong, then the chances of you having back pain are more likely because, I mean, that's where the most dense amount of nerves are in our lower back, you know? Right. And now if the muscles around that aren't strong, well, we're more at risk to have those tweaked or be out of position yeah. or I pull a muscle, I'm more likely to. I had to go to physical therapy for a while because it just locked up one day and I just couldn't do some things. And, um, you know, I had to work my way back into, I couldn't do a sit up. Yeah. You know? And, um, but what I found was, so I'm a little bit later, I'm, I'm now I'm doing some Push ups, some sit ups, some planks, some yep. things that the physical therapist asked me to work on, and I'm like, man, I'm way more physical when I play basketball. Mm-hmm. But I guess I'll do these cheesy exercises right. on the floor. <laughs> do what I have to do? Yeah, so I mean, trouble. do I have to really do this? Yeah, and I'm doing a little yoga, this and that, and I'm like, what's the point? But slowly, I started to feel like the back pain started to go away, and I was at, I remember being at my brother in law's house, Bryce, and he had been doing CrossFit for about a year. And uh, he did a one-legged squat, you yeah. know, pistol. Yeah. And I and I was like, he's like, can you do a pistol? And I was like, well, if you can, I can. No, clearly. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty fit. Right. I can run faster than you. Right. So, I, no way. I yeah. didn't. I I didn't even come close to being able to do that. And then, um, you know, he did a few other things that were that actually were pretty. Seem fairly basic, right. right? But I couldn't, I wasn't even close to being able to make, do those movements. And so I got a little more involved and started doing some exercises, mostly because it was fun. Yeah. And it was like this new challenge. It was different. It was outside the box of my, you know, buys and tries and, yeah. you know, my typical kind of gym workout. And, uh, but slowly uh, I started to, ironically, I had had this opinion that, deadlifting was probably going to be bad for me and I should stay yeah. away from squats. You know, yeah. anything with a barbell is kind of like, that's for Risky. like Olympic stuff, but it's not yeah. good for my body. You know, those guys that are lifting all that weight are going to be crippled at 60. Right. You know, th- those kind of things. Yeah. And as I delve, delve into it more, the opposite has, is I have found the opposite to be true yeah. and I am stronger now and I have, I'm never really, I'm never injured hardly yeah. ever. And uh, I do a lot of physical things. And I liken it to when I'm playing basketball in the past. Sometimes you'd find yourself in a one-legged squat position. Yeah. In the middle of the game. Yeah. Right? As you're moving, you're just tweet. You're, and I never go into that position 99% of my time in my life. Yeah. Now I'm in that margin space I think you're talking about yeah. where – now I'm down in that one-legged squat. I'm about to fail, bro. <laughs> and I am going down <laughs> yeah, like something's yeah. tweaking. Right. So, right. I'm failing because I I don't have that base to go along with my sport-specific activity. Yeah. So once I started to, I think, build a base and started doing these other activities, and after a year of that, it's like, man, I my back. I, I try to tell people that I don't think people realize – how bad my back was. Yeah. I really, at one point I remember talking to the physical therapist and I had uh, been doing a pretty benign activity. I think I picked my daughter up and she it was like yeah. six months old and I, I literally back. was done. Yeah. And I'm, I'm back in the hospital and I can't move my back. And, and there, I remember, you know, not quite breaking down in tears, but coming close to it. Yeah. <laughs> and this gal <laughs> says, life's not over. You're going to get your back back. Right. You just got to do these things. Yeah. It's not over. And I'm like, it feels for the past year and Pretty a half like it's over. Right. Like, like I am not, I can't do the things I used to love to do. Yeah. And it's over. That's yeah. how it feels. And, and, it, and it took actually quite a long time to dig myself out of that, that yeah. position. And I think a lot of people give up and don't dig themselves out. Yeah. And I think it's because they like, uh, I think you're right. And they assume like, I'm done. And what's funny is statistically, there's like most people walk around with lower back 
issues, herniated discs yeah. and things like that. Most people have that. <clears throat> a little bit's like luck of the draw. Is it do does it irritate you or does it not? Mm-hmm. Like personally, I never want to get an MRI on my back because I don't <laughs> want to know what it looks like. Well, I think a lot of people, it's because of sitting at a desk. Yeah, I literally I was a consultant. I did some work for Big Five, and and then years after that, and and I think I sat in a desk for like eight hours, ten hours a day for like eight years. Yeah, and then we match that with like you know zero. <clears throat> kind of strength training in this in the form like you said it doesn't have to be crazy but anything where it's challenged us to, to keep a good position yeah. and that could be a you know 10 pound dumbbells it doesn't matter it's all relative you kind of match those things and man you're headed down the road of honestly i don't want to sound bad but decrepit dude you know <laughs> yeah, what i mean it's like, true <laughs> that's where the ibuprofen kicks in yeah like you're eating it like candy it's yeah. like vitamin i and that, so if we can create fitness like big fitness and again it's relative right but let's think of like uh let's think let's think of like some good strong numbers let's say somebody can deadlift 315 pounds Mm -hmm. and they can run a 5k in 28 minutes and uh you know they can back or front squat 225 pounds like those aren't crazy numbers once people start training you're not gonna wake up tomorrow if you have that now Mm -hmm. you're not gonna wake up tomorrow morning and not be able to do a sit up and not be able to stand up out of your chair and not be able to go for a longer run or ruck. It's not going to happen barring like some accident, you know, yeah, life threatening illness. Yeah. Something. It's just not going to happen. So fitness then acts as this gigantic hedge against sickness because if I'm on this side where fitness is, well then I have to actually like decline and pass through wellness before I get to sickness. Right. But if I'm just kind of hanging out by like, I'm just well, like the doctor (laughs) says I'm good. My resting heart rate, 75 beats (laughs) per minute and I can deadlift my body weight. But if I pick up the bag of dog food, I might mess up my back, you know, like, yeah, well now if I slip any further back, now I'm headed down the road of sickness and I I don't want anything to do with that, man. Yeah. I want to be like 80 cutting my grass and my golf shoes, (laughs) you know, beating up the kid that's still asking to go out with my daughter. Like that's what I want when I'm 80. So the more we have that base of fitness now, the more it acts as that hedge against sickness or. So in terms of uh, like movements, like one thing I remember having my dad do, I was like, he he had problems with his shoulders and a lot of bow hunters, they have some rotator cuff or shoulder issues. Right. And they're like, I can't shoot a bow anymore. And it's their passion. They they want to shoot a bow, and they yeah. keep lowering the poundage and so forth. But for them, they're like, my bow hunting days are over. Yeah, they're over. So again, like the back or the knee problem, you have someone who has a shoulder problem. I remember my dad saying, "Yeah, my shoulder's gone." He drove a truck for like, you know, yeah, forty years, and he's like this all day, every day. Yeah, that repetitive motion, repetitive injury. Yeah, kind of, that was. Sp- that sport specific kind of movement right. <laughs> all yeah. day long. And he's got this shoulder, right? Yeah. Both shoulders that are kind of locked up and kind of rounded. And they're just kind of yeah. like this all the time. So we started working with, with my dad and, uh, I was like, you know, some of the things I said, I started to tell him about it and he said, there's nothing son. It's just age. Right. I'm like, no, I mean, there's this old dude over here. Look at yes. this. He doesn't do he that. He doesn't do that. You know, <laughs> look at this. And, uh, I, and I said, it was like, let's have a wake up call. Let's, yeah. let's do this. So I'm like, okay, put your hands above your head, you know? And I yeah. had him put his hands above his head and he could only get him about this far. Yeah. He couldn't get his shoulder, his arm up, you and know? And that shouldn't be normal. No. Unfortunately, it's normal <laughs> for some people, but that's not normal. That's not the way you're supposed to move. And there's a lot of people. I So I've done that since then. Yeah. Um, hey, do a squat. And uh, I would say most of the people I know can't squat. Yeah. And that to me is like kind of scary since I take Super a dump scary. in the woods like right. every <laughs> like like I need to be able to I, squat. I squat all the time. I don't want to have to find a tree to prop and, up against. And that's <laughs> what I mo- a lot of the guys I hunt with need a tree to hang off of right. or one to lean <laughs> against. Or, and, then, <laughs> and I'm like that is a basic human function. Like yeah. we have evolved to be able to squat and poop. Yeah. And yet we have this problem where we that's can't not okay. do it. Um so these movement things where people have lost yeah. um the ability to to do these things if they can't comfortably i remember going to japan and everyone's uh, five or six guys yeah are outside the 7-eleven and they just squat 
in a circle and they're all hanging out and smoking a cigarette and talking yeah. and stuff and I join the group and as an American I'm like I I can't do this. Right. I'm mean, like I'm like 19, 20 years old yeah. and I cannot hang with these these like 25, 30-year-old guys in a squat position. Yeah. And they literally sat there comfortable as can be for like an hour. Yeah. And I I couldn't last a few minutes without my legs falling asleep or without being under a, a yeah. serious strain. Falling on your butt. That yeah. was kind of a wake-up call. And plus, the toilets in my apartments were wet. Were, no option. Were Eastern squatters. stuff. So they were squatters. <laughs> so I was like, okay, this has to change. Like, I need to... <laughs> I'm not exactly a a fast... Uh, uh, it my bowel movements take time. Yeah. So uh, it <laughs> Magazines helps. are good. I need, to, I need to relax and read a book and whatever get feel get the mood in and and so i was like okay i gotta figure out how to squat better and it just it just also was kind of a wake-up call for me i was surprised that every american that kind of that was with us that went there had the same problem while the japanese people were completely opposite and we didn't have any furniture in the house you know we we would sit Sit on the floor and that was brutal yeah it was brutal on the hips and they would sit in such comfort so that's when i started to realize uh that I lacked the flexibility and the mobility that that people three, four times my age had in yeah. this country and started to focus on that. And, and over the course of two years, because I wanted to really blend into their country and yeah. take on their customs and really get to you know be immersed in that. And I love those people. It became a, um, you know, I just, I was one of them, right? And yeah. then I come back and I've still retained that ability to do a good squad yeah. and, and use it throughout my life. But- a lot of people struggle with that movement in yeah. our country. Oh, for sure. I think you. What's cool is I think you said it in the sense that like it's not that it's not that any of those people never had it. We all had it. Like look right. at your kids. They squat like a ninja. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like they can sit down, put their butt on the ground, kick their legs out, put their legs back up. Like no hands, stand up. It's crazy. So it's not that we never had it. And for sure, genetics play a role with some people being a little bit more tight through the shoulders or the hips, but we all had some function of mobility. And I think uh, just because of that lifestyle at the desk, driving the truck, not not just going through those normal anatomical ranges is what we would say is yeah. you lose it if you don't. And so an encouragement is that it's not something we never had. And then also just to help people get into perspective, as I said this to a guy the other day, and he is an old, he's the older guy at the gym, and he was like, hey, it's like, I'm so tight. It's like, it's so hard to get into some of these positions. You know, like, same thing, overhead stuff is really hard, and he's 63 or 64. I was like, hey, Greg, I was like, how long did it take you to get tight? And he started to laugh, and he's like, well, about 63 years. And I was like, well... <laughs> It's not going to change in two weeks. So, like, <laughs> let's just be patient right. and then start working toward that. But you can regain that. And the best way, I, I'm a big believer in the best way for us to regain capacity, mobility through those ranges of motion is just to start doing the movements. Mm. Just do them unloaded. You know, you don't have to do anything crazy. And if you're just, if you think squatting's bad, just sit down on the toilet and stand up and do it 50 times that day and, you, you, there you go. You just started. Start it. <laughs> and, and I think it's the same thing. It's like, like adjust it. Like do what you can up to the point where you, up to the limit of your mobility. Yeah. You Challenge know? the range of motion. Make sure your position's good. And like, that's a learned thing, understanding what those things are. You know, hey, mm-hmm. I, ideally it's in some ways, like keep it simple. The old high school football coach was right. Lift your chest, arch your back. You know, yeah. like if your back's flat, you know. Your knees are out, tracking your toes. Like you're gonna be okay. So let's say a guy does have a bad shoulder. You know what are? How does he get that back? How does he fix? Yeah. It? First, I think uh, I think it's actually really smart that these guys are changing the poundage on their bow because you gotta let it rest, right? So mm-hmm. it doesn't mean we necessarily have to completely stop, but maybe it creates like a, a cool challenge in the meantime. Like uh, I saw, what is it Aaron? Mm-hmm. Uh, that he just got. Uh, a mule deer up in yep, up the recurve. curve. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So maybe we could go to more of you know traditional a style traditional style bow. bow and use that while we let our shoulder kind of recover and chill out. You guys are still gonna get a chance to be good at you know using the bow, shooting. You're gonna mm-hmm. still retain all that skill. Mechanics, I'm sure, are probably better. Very similar. Yeah. Right. And then over the time. Okay, now as we start to let things kind of calm down, give it a chance to rest, 
Well, now we start to do things that are really normal. There's going to be with Icon. I'm actually, it's funny. I was talking to a guy, Brett, that's a PT here. And we're going to start to try to put in some like little prehab and rehab programs for shoulders and hips and knees and just doing little things like that. Kind of like you started with, with the back, yeah. just base level stuff. It might be some banded work, helping people learn what a good shoulder position is. So you're kind of developing some exercises and programs that people can, that have like that shoulder issue yeah. can kind of get into and start with those basic movements and stuff to sort of start rebuilding their shoulders. Yeah. And then it's as simple as, okay, like once I can go through these things Mm pain-free, well, let's try other movements. And if it's pain-free range of motion, well, then I'm going to do it. Yeah. Let pain be your guide. And if it's a pain-free range of motion, well, maybe I can put some kind of external loading on it. And that might look like a dumbbell or a barbell. Well, all that kind of bothers it. Okay, well, let's back off and go mm-hmm. back to that pain-free mm-hmm. range. But if it doesn't bother it, you can meet the range of motion standards that you're looking for. You know your arm all the way overhead. Yep, yep. Cool. Let's start to get strong through that range of motion. Mobility, I think people sometimes think is king, but mobility without strength is useless. Mm. I have to have strength through the range of motion that I have. Yeah. So we don't just want mobility for the sake of being like, I'm so limber. Like that doesn't really Translate help. into yeah. useful... And I see that nothing against it at all because I think it's uh, there's a great value. But I see that with like yoga, you know, is they have these great ranges, but often they don't have any strength. Mm-hmm. So then it's like, well, we kind of lose that purpose and we could still risk injury there. Yeah. So instead of having Some of the these, best yoga is the stuff where they're, I think, where they're actually using muscle Yeah, it's in the position. Yeah. And it's funny, like you guys work just like a machine, right? Mm-hmm. If I have muscles that are more flexible, then it's easier to get into that position. Yeah. So when we see people that are like these insane yogis, I sometimes am like, you know what? Like, I don't necessarily think they're real strong. I think they're real mobile. Mm-hmm. Because if you told that guy or girl to stand under a 300 pound barbell and just stand it up or put on the pack that you guys yeah. have to carry, who? Well, that's different right. because now it's external loading. So how do I build strength through the ranges of motion? Mm-hmm. And that's a mix of doing the movements well and doing them with varied reps and varied loading. Yeah. So when you take a, a movement like that, like a, like a squat, for example, and you, so for me, I didn't really have a, the mobility I have now. Yeah. Until I started lifting heavy loads. Uh huh. It was like I would stretch and maybe, and I, my dad, myself, genetically, I think we're pretty stiff. Yeah. We're, you know, we have r- stretchy, we have really tight ligaments and yeah. tendons, right? Like we're not, I never was super limber. Yep. And in a way, I feel like it adds to my strength it when does. I'm lifting. Yeah, it does. It's not loose, it's tight. Yep. But in order for me to get into that deep squat, I just need, you know, 300 pounds pushing right my back right. to get me there. Because <laughs> yeah. if I just try to stretch there, I just don't get in there. Yeah. And I think over time, now I can get in those positions. Now I can, yeah. but I think I needed the, the weight of that bar to push me there. I remember reading Kelly Starrett and he was talking about our our ligaments and our tendons being like steel cables. Yeah. Like they're in some denser than others and different genetically, but those cables are... You're not it just by pulling on it, like stretching to touch your toes. Yeah, you're not going to change the length of that cable. Uh uh-uh. uh It just that that's not doing it. Right. And I I know I did yoga and I could increase a little bit of range yeah. of motion, but I swear I just sat there for like a year in the same kind of. Then I put a bar on my back and all of a sudden I could get into deeper squats and deeper positions than yeah. I could without. I just needed that kind of force, I think, to change my muscle fiber or something, yep. change my ligaments for sure some people are like that some people are just like naturally hyper mobile so it's like they can just go through these big ranges of motion and like they my have daughter to my youngest she can do weird things with all her yeah, body like she yeah. can take her finger and she can bend it around to here and she's on the school bus with this kid and she's like <laughs> doing this, this over here and the kid goes and she's young right she's and the kid goes that's how do you do that and hannah goes yeah you just do it like this she pulls it right <laughs> and the girl goes 
I can't do it. And Hannah goes, sure you can't. Just grabs it and just <laughs> bends her finger down. And she gets called I into the principal you and all this kind of stuff. She's like, well, I didn't. I just thought it was normal. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So some people are like that. And they. what's funny is those people have to learn how to create tension in ranges of motion. I see that with people doing like squats, right? Yeah. Like they'll, loosey, they'll do this. Loosey. Yeah, they're just loose and like they're going down with the bar. And it's like your your whole back is yeah. inverted. I'm like, like, bro, like you got to <laughs> brace. <laughs> like you got to brace. Like, the noodle yes. like they're they're so flexible they have to figure out how to find a way to not i i have the yeah. opposite problem most people do yeah so yeah. most people do and like that so some are like that but on most scenarios we'll see people come in that have some kind of tension which isn't necessarily bad because like you said um the way your muscles work is they kind of like overlap one another right and mm-hmm. the more that they overlap the more strength we have because mm-hmm. the more they can contract right the more dense yeah. they are now if you start to spread them out that's not bad because that can lengthen our muscle yeah. but now it also there's less crossover mm-hmm. so they can't contract as hard or there's yeah. not as dense of a contraction right so you want don't think tension's bad so tension's good um but you want to make sure that if you are tight and you do need and i see other people like this come in the gym you know they have a really hard time reaching ranges of motion with really good form without any kind of loading because they don't have anything to fight against yeah. Now, what I want those people to do is I want you to be able to work toward, don't just be like, okay, that's just me. That's just me. Yeah, we want to work toward being able to do that movement without without help. Yeah. But if you are one of those people that a little bit of feedback helps where we have a bar on our back or, you know, we load it up to 95 pounds or even just a barbell and that helps us get into a better position, Mm -hmm. well, then do it. Because now if we're getting to a better position and achieving a better range of motion, that's going to help stretch yeah. and that's going to help create strength through the range of motion. And then over time, you're right. That improves the position without the loading. Yeah. And it's not, it's not a bad thing, but it's just us understanding, okay, what, you know, go back to that context. You know, what do I, what am I looking for? I don't need to back squat 500 pounds, yeah. you know, but like what do I need to do to make me better out there and live a better quality of life. One thing that, um, um, a lot of guys suffer from is knee pain. Yeah. Right. And uh, I remember watching Kelly Starrett talk about this and he, he made a comment, something like what you said earlier about um, being in the, the fit category versus, you know, traveling through that into the sick category. Yeah. You know, just the well category isn't quite good enough that when you take a guy that has had uh, that has some knee pain, he, he was saying that I don't know anybody who can do a proper squat yep. under load that has knee problems uh-huh. it, it's aside from catastrophic injury and, you know, you yeah. blew your ACL out and, you know, the NFL, you're, that's a, that's a problem. Right? right, right. But, but aside from that, your normal dude, if you can squat properly, he's like, I just don't see the knee problems mm-hmm. that people typically have. Yeah. So that struck me as like, really? Like that's a, that's a bold statement. Yeah. So at that point I was like, well, most people I say, show me your squat. It's one of the, it. It just is one of the the it's telling the bro. T- ter- most terrible movements I've ever seen. You're like, uh, yeah, you can instantly be like, ooh, <laughs> that's. I don't have to like be. I don't have to be some movement ninja to be like that. Doesn't look right, <laughs> right? But <laughs> see, I think a lot of people don't recognize it, and so I'll run into them. They'll they'll be like, well, I I actually do squats one day a week because if I do them more than one day a week, my knees hurt. Yeah. So I do them one day a week uh, with a load at the gym. And I'll be like, okay, well, what is it that you're doing? Like, what's that squat look like? And they'll show me and I'll look at their movement and then I'll realize, well, I know why you have knee pain. What does a proper squat look like? Yeah. And what is it that when people do, because a lot of people are like, okay, I, I love what Chris Spieler's saying. I love what Gritty Bowen's saying. I'm going to go grab a bar and I'm going to start doing squats right. and I'm going to start doing deadlifts. Right. Now, I applaud that, that effort, that drive, that desire, but- sure. The, the the critical part is it doesn't do you very much good if you do it wrong. Right. And it's funny. You think that it's just you squat and you stand up. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. And so like kind of going back to, I think, I think that <clears throat> for the general population that if they know how to squat well, the chances of knee pain are minimal. I think like if you think about uh, a guy like myself, like I squatted well, but same thing, man, overuse. Like yeah. when I was going into like highly competitive stuff with CrossFit and trying to keep up with guys that weigh, 
60 more pounds than me and moving those loads like overuse. I was yeah. moving well, but overuse still caught up to me. Right. But for people that are just like, hey, I just want to be fit. Yeah, I don't see people squatting well with pain unless they have a pre-existing injury. Mm -hmm. um, and what it, what it means is basically four things you want to pay attention to. Out of safety, it's your back, right? So your back should be flat. And that just means when you stand up, your back's in a neutral position position for most people, you know? So that shouldn't change. So that that the spine should just be flat. It should got it. You shouldn't be arching or curving. Yeah. So if you overextend real forward. hard or round real hard, not real good. Um so you just want to keep that neutral position. We do that. So by, even as you go down in the squat, your back should still be doesn't change. Should still be your spine should be aligned. Yep. You got it. And that's like the big safety piece, especially when we talk about loading. Um, two, not necessarily in order of importance, but knee position is really important. So some people will kind of turn their feet differently, and that's not bad. Some people like to toe out real hard. Some people toe forward. That's not bad. We just want to make sure your knees go in the direction your toes are pointed. Most people want to cave in. So we want to make sure your knees are pressed out, tracking over your toes. And that's going to help people use the right muscles. And also it makes it easier to get kind of the third thing, which is depth. Depth is just encouraging the range of motion that you guys are built to go through. And that's your hip crease below your knee. So a lot of people are taught to squat above or two parallel because mm -hmm. suddenly if we go below, our knees are going to explode. Right. Yep. Yep. But <laughs> like, so it's like, okay, so where did we hear that? Um, that's what I was taught. Yeah, in right? high school, basketball yeah, coach. You're gonna like you're this is bad for your it's knees. Um, but that study, what's funny is that study was done in the 70s by a guy that did the test on cadavers. So <laughs> the, he used the, a cadaver to test the tension on the knee. Um, when the truth is, just like you saw in Japan, mm -hmm. if people squat with their hips below their knees, it actually loads your hips more than your knees, takes pressure off yeah. of your knees. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just a normal anatomical range for the joint. Yeah. It's not, you're not doing anything it's not supposed to do. So um, as I, pre as I, I'll do like a pause squat. Yeah. You know, I'll go down with a super heavy load to the bottom of the squat and just sit there. Yeah. And I'm super relaxed. My ligaments, I think, are stretched as far as they can go. Yeah. Everything is like under tension. But your back's, your belly's tight, right? Everything's tight. Tension. Yeah. yeah. And then, then after so many seconds, then I'll stand up. Yeah. Um, you can't do that with that kind of load and stop before you reach, before you bottom out in that position. Like yeah. I just, it's, yeah. It, and it yeah. seems like that's what I would do a lot when I first, when I was lifting with Chad in college and stuff, my college roommate, I would go down and I'd go to like parallel yeah, stop. and then stop and yeah. then try to go back up. And the pain on my knees, the pressure it was putting on my knees. That's the most. was yeah. heavy, right? Like trying to stop in the middle of it. Yeah. And, uh, so I was reading Mark Ripito's, yeah. or Ripito's book, uh, Starting Strength, you yeah. know, years ago. And uh, and he, he had some diagrams and he was describing how yeah, to do yeah. it. And I was like, it That's was mind-blowing. It. Yeah. it really was. And so, and he described going to the bottom and your hamstrings and, and your tendons some and everything spring, yeah. are springy. Yeah. And when you hit that bottom, you're, you're actually leveraging the rubber bands, yeah. your net body's natural elasticity yeah the, the proper mechanics of your body you you you're okay it's okay to bounce a little bit and yeah. come out of that and uh so once i started doing that i was like well that feels good it's easier it feels really good <laughs> yeah. yeah and i started to get more power and more speed and stronger and and but that whole idea was vastly different and yeah. my cue that i that i really rely on a lot is this the knees out like yeah I use a lot of adductor strength and I, and I tend to, I try, I don't like my knees to go too far forward. Yep. And when I squat and do all these movements, if my, if my knees don't go out over my toes, you know, if they've, uh, it's sort of like a box squat. Yep. If I can just kind of keep my shins vertical, yep. I guess that might be a good cue. Yeah, yeah. If my shins can stay fairly vertical, I just get, seem to get stronger and stronger knees, stronger and stronger hips. Strong, I just, I don't have any problems. Yeah. But that's where, when I do something like an overhead squat, I can't yeah. seem to get into that position without my knees a lot further forward. Yeah. And I just don't know. That's not bad. So it's, again, kind of go back to context. What's funny 
is it's all like it's all linked, right? Mm-hmm. So if you're doing a good job of keeping your back flat, everything else is going to be tied to it, right? And like one of the big pieces there that's going to make a squat easier is an upright torso because the more upright our torso is, mm-hmm. the more the load moves down and up instead of forward and back. Yeah. And that's more efficient, right? But how does that happen? If my shoulders have to go back and this is my hip, well, now my hip has to come forward. And if my hip has to come forward, then something else has to go forward. My knee has to go forward. And if my knee goes forward, there has to be more mobility at my ankles. My ankle. So those are all tied together. Interconnected. And yeah. if, I, if I move one, if I move my knee back, my hip goes back, my shoulder goes forward. You know, so it's all kind of tied into that. And that's where... It's funny, I was showing the, that guy, Greg, this morning, a video of this guy on what's called hook grip. And uh, mm-hmm. this is these Olympic lifters, and their mobility, their range of motion is just crazy. But they're so strong. And we can still have healthy position and healthy knees with our knees tracking forward. And the, I mean, the easiest thing I could relate it to is when you hike uphill, your knee is over your, t- it's in front of your mm-hmm. toe. It's in front. It's always in front of your toe, and that's why I think um, it's important for us to go through those ranges and and get that strength there, because it's just a normal place to be. Yeah, yeah. And then overuse, we got to take that into consideration. Chances are, a lot of the knee pain that guys feel, um, it's probably tendonitis. You know, a lot of hiking up, especially downhill, is where they probably feel the pain. Uh, if they're carrying yeah. a loaded pack. It's normally downhill. Yeah. If they're carrying a loaded pack and they're downhill, it's because our knees are continually going over our toes, which again, isn't bad, but... All that sheer weight from the knee on the sh- on the shin and all that. If you gotta... do that again and again, it's just like if, you, if that's all you do five or six days a week for your training and you don't do anything to strengthen the muscles around it and you're carrying a loaded pack, your knees are going to hurt. It's just going to, it's just going to happen. Yeah. Your tendons just, they don't get as much ligaments and tendons. They don't get as much blood flow as muscle, not even close to the same amount. Blood flow is really important for healing because it flushes in the yeah. system and it shuttles nutrients to our muscles. And it's just harder to create blood flow to that stuff. So it's really likely to see people with injuries if that's all they do. So a guy that uh, is having knee pain, shoulder pain, back pain, um, you know, uh, what I would like them to take away from this podcast is not to give up. No. That that there is, there are things you can do, keep fighting. And, and if you do the right things, yeah, you can be very, very strong, very healthy again. Yeah. And step one is rest. A hundred percent. I went through it. I mean, I went through a, a time in my life where I couldn't carry my kids up and down steps. I couldn't run. I couldn't hike downhill. I mean, I went through it. And there's a period of rest rest, let your body recover, mm-hmm. you know, give yourself a chance to recover so you can find pain for your ranges of motion. And in the meantime, don't give up, do the stuff that you can still do, whether it's shooting a different bow or whether it's going a different distance on a hike, or maybe it's you guys staying on flat land and you can still carry a loaded pack, or maybe it just change, yeah. change the process. So you give yourself a chance to recover. What do you think about like Kelly Starrett mentioned, you know, movement patterns, and, um, sometimes for example, I know people who can do a good squat, but then when they're not squatting, they go back to leaning over their toes, getting on their toes when they go down to right. the ground and so, like, they don't carry over the good movement into everyday life. Yeah. Like they st- still reinforce some bad mechanics. Yeah. Um, I, I t- have a tendency to get really sore rhomboids and stuff. And I think some of that's just because of the way I sit sit yeah, yeah, and yeah. use my shoulders sure. and one thing that guys do is when they pull their bows and stuff i mean it'd be interesting to get uh an idea on what is the pro- proper way to pull a bow yeah. back with you know what what because there's lots of ways you could do it you could yeah. kind of extend your shoulder and yeah. pull it or you could kind of tuck it in and pull it or yeah, chances are it's because guys do this Right, so if you get ready to pull your bow and your shoulders rotated in, mm-hmm. this is what you call internal rotation. That's not so great. Yep. When we're at flexion, yeah, flexion. I think they do we want to have what we Elbows say a little high external rotation. Right. So, mm-hmm. what I would suggest is just step one, like just like you don't want to sit like this. If you cannot pull a bow like that, if you can have your shoulder packed down and back, 
it's okay to have your elbow high, but if my elbow's high, the higher it goes, the more likely I'm going to be rotating it. If I'm not mindful to so people pin are this watching, back, they can see how you're internally rotating your yeah. shoulder, which pulls the the socket out of. It's the, just not a strong balls. position. It's not okay. a great position. Okay. Right. So if we have more, you know, if we create this position versus this position. This is just a stronger position, right? Okay. So when we start to pull back, instead of having shoulder rotated in and elbow out, what if you keep your elbow down? And what if you raise yep. your elbow once you're back? That's, so that's, instead of raising your elbow at the start, yeah. as I know when you taught me, it was like, no, you want your elbow high. Mm -hmm. Well, that's okay because that's behind, but we don't have to start the pull there. Right. What if you start the pull with your elbow close, yep. shoulders pinned back, and then you set your elbow high? You might be able to, you might find that you could use the same poundage on your right. bow now and still have the correct mechanics when it's time to shoot. But I mean, is there, I think people get stuck in like, well, no, this is the only mechanic for shooting a bow. Yeah. It's like, yeah. well, is that right for you? I Maybe tend to not. do a lot more push than yeah. pull. Like a lot of guys just have their, this arm fully extended. They reach and they reach around. Yeah. They've got that internal rotation. They grab the bow and then they pull and there's all that strain on my shoulder i tend to grab the bow like this yeah and with a compound it's different than shooting a traditional bow but then i just sort of press it out and yeah. i just feel like so much less pressure on my on my shoulder it's more of a press with my where i have all this leverage and yep. it, I, I don't know with a compound it's i can also draw slower and more i played with it right yeah. like how to pull it back where it felt and you're using, you're engaging different muscles yeah. to do the same, to get the same end goal. And just do that. Draw. That's my encouragement too. Is like, just like we talked about with the training, it doesn't mean you have to stop shooting, right? It doesn't mean you have to stop, but pay attention to what you're doing and start to find positions or ranges of motion that are pain-free. And if something works better for you, but the end result is that you still shoot well, mm -hmm. that's not wrong. So what if it looks different than somebody else? Yeah. Like who gives a crap? Yeah. You know? Yeah. What do you think about people? So this is the, the, how does a guy tell or a gal tell when they should stop because they're experiencing pain versus you know because I'll have guys go okay I did your squats yeah and the next day they're like my knee's sore I'm not I, I just yeah, I'm, I'm down I'm yeah. backing out so I would say that's a good uh, again context are we injured or are we sore okay. right those are two different things when we're injured it's like I physically cannot do something. Or that's like uh, the kind of pain where it's a bit more debilitating or chronic, right? But if we're sore, well, good on you, man, because you're <laughs> using stuff, right? And like soreness generally will subside with an increase in core temperature and increase in blood flow. So if you warm up, let's say you're like, okay, I'm still not sure about this. I did the squat thing or I did the deadlift thing and I feel like stuff just feels sore, right? Or maybe it's like mm -hmm. I'm worried... Some people are like, I'm injured. My back's yeah, tight. Yeah. I'm injured. Well, no, it's not. It's just tight. But a good way to kind of figure out, okay, what's the difference is if you guys start to do something just as a warm up, right? Maybe it's like you do some stretching. You go for a like real easy jog or whatever that is. You have a rower. You get on the rower to start moving real easy. And as you start to get your blood flow going, you start to breathe a little bit. You warm up. If you start feeling better and the pain subsides, well, that's real good news. Because that's generally just because we're sore. But if we start to find that as we sit on the rower, every time I drive, my knee hurts at this same spot. Well, now I would say, okay, well, do we want to limit the range of motion? Don't give up, right? Don't stop because guess what? I don't care who you are. You're still going to have to squat every day. And the day that you can't squat, guess where you're going to be? You're going to be in a nursing home, bro. <laughs> and that's not where I want to be. Right. I don't want someone else taking care of me. Yeah. So it's like, okay, well, let's figure out a range of motion that I can do today. And guess what I have to do to this day? I have to take a workout. And I might be like, man, like, this is my jam. Like, yeah. I'm going to crush this thing. When I was a kid, I broke my arm in half and dislocated my shoulder at the same time. I think <laughs> I have a torn labrum. Yeah. I have stuff that happens to my back. I've had knee issues. So for me, I'm like, okay, even though this is my jam today, maybe something just doesn't feel right mm -hmm. and it might be my shoulder. So you know what? I'm just going to back off and use lighter weight or I'm going to substitute this movement yeah. for that. It doesn't mean I stop. You don't quit. No. The second you guys stop, you're in trouble, yeah. right? Because now we're just heading back toward that sickness. But if I can navigate around that, mm -hmm. keep the muscles strong around the joint, maybe I do a different row. Instead of doing a pull-up, maybe I do a ring row or a barbell row. I you find the, those pull. exercises you can do without the pain. 
Yeah, exactly. And it could be a range of motion or it could be substituting the movement. Yeah. I found that that's, to me, uh, one thing is uh, as I lift weights and do exercise, my hormone levels switch. Yeah. Like, like I just produce a lot more testosterone. You do. And yeah. so when I get injured or something, if I just go, oh, yeah, I, I hurt my ankle, so I'm just out. Yeah. Okay. Well, all the benefits I get from being healthy start to circle the drain. Yeah. And I start to have problems. Mood. Yeah. My mood. But my ankle doesn't heal that fast. Now, if I go and I do workouts anyway around my ankle. Yep. It's like I heal like in two weeks yeah. versus two months. There's it's research phenomenal. that shows that. Yeah, it's funny. There's like Doug, he actually just walked in the background. He's a guy that he, uh, when he was a kid playing ice hockey, he tore his labrum and he kind of let it ride out. And um, he got surgery on it a couple years ago and he was in his you know, sling for like, I think it was six weeks. Mm-hmm. You're like, Doug, like you should try to like just lift a bunch, like do other stuff, like do back squats, like all the stuff where he didn't have to use his arm. He's like, you should try to just gain a bunch of weight and get super strong. And he's like, all right, I have nothing else to do, so why not? I'll try Why not? It. Yeah. So he did it, and literally two weeks out of his sling, he set a new personal best on his split jerk, which is a shoulder to overhead movement. Yeah. And we were like, what the, what the crap is that, <laughs> man? Like, There's research that shows that even though we might have an injury and a serious one, like a surgery, if we can keep the other side strong the injured side will keep up. It just will. Yeah. It has to keep up. And I, I've seen it happen. And I just think it's one of the cooler things. And like, I just feel like it's part of just like living, li- yes, doing, doing of, life. Yeah. Being right? active. Yes. It's part of like, I want to say, and I know there's like the ladies out there listening too, but it's just part, like for me, it's just like part of being a dude. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just like, you just, you just you don't quit, right? Mm-hmm. Like you don't stop because <laughs> there's one thing that's like a little bit tough. It's like, man, welcome to life, yeah. you know? Find like a way what around we, it. Yeah, Keep what we going. do in here has direct carryover out there, not just physically, but mentally too. That's the other thing that's really neat about um, my, when I work out and I'm active and I'm, I'm and I try to be fit and healthy, it changes how I act interact with people yeah how i feel when i'm with a group of people yeah um how i feel about going into the wilderness you know on some remote hunt by my you know there's just a a certain amount of uh i don't know just conquer the world feeling that comes from yeah that kind of fitness you're prepared man like yeah, it's, it's not this i wonder if yeah i wonder if i'm gonna make it right like <laughs> right. I'm i don't want to say that like whoa what if something like ooh, i don't yeah. know if i'm gonna be able to like make my way back out like i just there's no question right right so i i like what you said though about uh when you're experiencing some pain like um uh is it soreness or is it injury and something i just wanted to 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 repeat was um you can determine that somewhat by 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 raising core body temperature up so getting warmer yeah increase your blood flow and increasing blood flow yeah and if as a result of that, um, you're feeling a lot better, more limber. The soreness is is much less. It's not like pain. It's more like soreness. Yeah, maybe a little You can feel the difference. Yeah, for sure. Uh, it's interesting because a lot of times I think people feel that soreness. They don't do the core body temperature increase. They don't yeah. increase blood flow. They don't get moving. And so they don't know that it's just soreness. Yeah. They like, I'm going to try injury. to lift. Oh, that's, that's super tight. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I'm stopping. That's normal. That's a normal response. Anytime you introduce a new stimulus, there's going to be a response. And one of the results is you're going to be sore until you kind of adapt to it. Yeah. Well, cool. I think this, this kind of helps people get an idea. You know, don't give up. Don't quit. You know, keep. Uh, it, it, you know, if you've got a shoulder, knee, back issue, start looking into um, things you can do yeah. to, to get those stronger. One thing I'd like to ta- touch on in another podcast is like what goes hand in hand with a lot of this, I think, is is what you put in your body, yeah. you know, in terms of nutrition. For sure. And that's going to impact inflammation and soreness. Big time. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we can chalk that up for another date, but... I think this was really useful. I appreciate you coming Dude, on. My pleasure, man. Always. Yeah. All right. Cool. Stay gritty. Yeah, bro. <laughs> Friends, hunters, outdoorsmen, lend me your ears. Please take this moment to listen to this excerpt from the Gritty Bowman film, Back to Traditions. 
despite our ever-changing, ever-indignant world with its growing ignorance of and indifference to the ways of the wild, I remain a predator, pitying those who revel in artificiality and synthetic success while regarding me and my kind as relics of a time and place no longer valued or understood. I stalk a real world of dark wood and tall grass stirred by a restless wind blowing across sunlit water and beneath star-strewn sky. And on those occasions when I choose to kill, to claim some small part of nature's bounty for my own, I do so by choice, quickly, with the learned efficiency of a skilled hunter. Further, in my heart and mind, I know the truth and make no apologies for my actions or my place in time. Others around me may opt to eat only plants, nuts, and fruits. Still others may employ faceless strangers to procure their meats, their leather, their feathers, and all those niceties and necessities of life. Such is their right, of course, and I wish them well. All I ask in return is no one begrudge me, and all of us who may answer the primordial stirrings within our hunter's souls, my right to do some of these things myself. What you just heard is a quote from M.R. James. We truly live in a world that is largely ignorant and indifferent to the ways of the wild. And although some regard us as relics of a time and place no longer valued or understood, we have the opportunity to change the way these people view the hunter and the hunt. We can share our experiences and nature's bounty with those who employ these faceless strangers. And by so doing, we make a difference, not just for ourselves, but for the wild animals in the wild places we care so deeply about. Never stop sharing your passion for hunting and the outdoors. Our wild animals and our wild places depend on it. We want to thank Kefaru, Mountain Ops, Hoyt, Vortex, Phelps, Black Eagle Arrows, and Crispy Boots for supporting the Gritty Bowman. We love these companies and the people behind them. They truly make fantastic products. Please support them whenever you can. And as always, good luck on your hunts and stay gritty. This is Ty Stubblefield and you're listening to The Gritty Bowman. Gray Bowman. <laughs>